to be speaking with you today. And I um, really appreciate Rudy reaching out to me. It's a, a nice change of pace for me to do something like this. I do have a, um, a presentation here. It, I'll pull up short momentarily. I will warn you that once I pull that presentation up, I'm kind of blind. I'm only going to see the presentation. So I apologize if I'm not able to um, see anything that shows up on the screen at that time. I have 37 slides, so that makes it seem like that ought to take three hours. I promise I'll try to target, um, go through some of them quickly and um, target around 60 minutes for my presentation and then give you all about 30 minutes or so to ask me questions. I will attempt to answer them to the best of my ability and just tell you I don't know if I don't know. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and hit present. You can see it here, Dana. All right, good, thank you. All right, so I am Dana White, as Rudy mentioned, and I work for the Tennessee Valley Authority. Today, I wanted to first tell you a little bit about TVA. As Rudy mentioned, we're a very interesting utility. Um, we do a lot more than make electricity. So I wanted to tell you about that and we have a very rich history. I'll also tell you about me, um, kind of where I started and, and where I've been and where I am now. I will say when Rudy talked about how long I had been with TVA and with Southern Company, um, I, I like to tell people that I started in the utility industry when I was 10 years old, just in case people try to start with that math, that gets a little scary and daunting to me. And then Rudy also mentioned I've been working um, really in the last couple of years, focusing a large part on um, improving myself as an individual and a leader. And it's a, largely due to some work that I have learned about through Brene Brown. And I will share some of that with you. So the title, Learning to Pivot, I'll, I'll explain why I chose that um, as we go through the presentation, but I've just got the definition here. You know, it's to turn or twist or, um, more importantly, in the context of this is to change your opinions, uh, decisions, uh, so that they're different from what they were before. And I think you'll see that both the generation industry has had to change a lot. And then I think that most of us go through quite a bit of change. Um, if you're looking at some odd 30 something year career, and I'll share with you some of those challenges and thought processes I've dealt with. First, Talk about um, TVA a little bit. Here is a map of, of the Tennessee Valley area. We do have uh, seven states, so it's pretty broad, pretty exciting. People do think that with TVA being a federal agency that we are funded by taxpayers' dollars, but um, that's not true. Our power generation side of TVA has been financially independent since 59. And then we have been solely independent in all aspects of our business since 1999. And we pay through the various activities we do um, through the money we make through selling power. While we were started by the government, we have paid back the government um, for that initial investment with TVA and, and what those escalations would be. We continue to make payments to the federal government yearly. And we also, although we don't pay true taxes as TVA, we make payments to all the areas within the Tennessee Valley that are called tax equivalent payments in these seven states. I will tell you just a little bit about TVA history. It, it is a big part of the Tennessee Valley and the progress that's been made here. Um, in 1916, we were preparing for World War I and we were worried about our munition supplies and the government decided, Woodrow Wilson decided that they would put um, a couple of nitrate plants in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and they built a hydroelectric dam. Well, around the time those munitions plants were ready to 
to operate, World War I was over. And so they were going to sell all of the property in Muscle Shoals and what had been built. Um, Henry Ford was going to buy it for like $5 million. Now think about this, this is back in 1921. And that property had cost, the property and all the, the upgrades that had been done um, had cost the government about $130 million to build. And um, we did not end up selling it to Henry Ford. I think that politics probably were complicated back then like they are today. And it's, it's slow to make things happen. Finally, Ford withdrew his offer. And for a while, uh, companies such as Alabama Power um, and others um, tried to, to um, move forward in that land and area. But Senator Norris, George Norris, he had an idea about rural electrification and came up with a plan that he thought felt it would improve the Tennessee Valley area. And that was around an integrated resource management plan about combining what people, the um, richness of the Tennessee River uh, and ways to improve the, combine the resources and people. Now, at the time, this was what Norris put together was a foundation for the, what became the TVA Act. However, it, it was not um, passed right away. But when uh, I guess that around 1929, as we went into the Great Depression, uh, there, that things had changed. Um, and Fra Franklin, Roose Franklin Roosevelt was um, elected as president of the United States in 1932. And with the economic disaster that was happening in the US and which was even worse for those in the Tennessee Valley, it um, became more important to do. When you looked at the Tennessee Valley at that point in time, um, it was especially challenging. There were really poor farming practices that were happening in the area. There was lots of flooding. Um, one reason, you know, that's a big piece of what TVA has done is to control the rivers because many parts of the Tennessee Valley were flooded. There was soil erosion. Um, the income in the area was extremely low, but the birth rate was higher than most anywhere else in the nation. Literacy levels were extremely low, very unskilled workforce. And so when you look back at that plan that Senator Norris had, that became with the current, the 1933 political and economic climate, the, it became a really important thing to do to, as part of what Roosevelt was doing in the New Deal, uh, as Rudy mentioned, he got also behind this plan that Senator Norris had and signed the TVA Act in 1933. I'm gonna read um, some language that came out of President Roosevelt's um, work about and what he said about the Tennessee Valley. And just because it's the way it's written is, is really good to describe um, how important this is to, to the Valley. It is clear that the Muscle Shoals development is but a small part of the potential public usefulness of the entire Tennessee River. Such use, if envisioned in its entirety, transcends mere power development. It enters the wide fields of flood control, soil erosion, afforestation, elimination from agricultural use of marginal lands, and distribution and diversification of industry. Or five others. I therefore suggest to the Congress legislation to create a Tennessee Valley Authority a corporation clothed with the power of government, but possessed of the flexibility and initiative of a private enterprise. It should be charged with the broadest duty of planning for the proper use, conservation and development of the natural resources of the Tennessee River drainage basin. And it's adjoining territory for the general social and economic welfare of the nation. And so why I wanted to bring that up is that you know, I came originally from 
Southern Company, which is made up of Alabama Power, Georgia Power, Southern Nuclear, several small, smaller or several large um, utilities make up Southern Company. And for my first year there, years there, you know, it is a it is owned by um, its stakeholder, and its purpose is around making money for the people who own stock in the company. So it's about profit for most utilities that where there are stockholders. But for Tennessee Valley Power, as Frank, as President Roosevelt said, power was a secondary matter. It's intended to change and improve the standards of living of the people. And so when I came to TVA, that was very different. And to, it took me a long time to understand why we had certain aspects of our business that were not around generating electricity. So when we, we've, we're pretty proud at TVA of our mission that it's not profit, but it's actually to serve the people of the Valley and to make life better for the people of the Valley. We feel that's unique and uh, noble and we're proud of it. So our mission to the Valley, we always call these the three E's, <laughs> energy, environment, and economic development. And so while we do make electricity, we have transmission lines that, you know, move this electricity all throughout the Tennessee Valley. Um, but we also are extremely focused on preserving the natural resources in the valley. And I'm sure Rudy can attest that the Tennessee Valley is a beautiful area. You will find um, many rivers, mountains, flatlands. There are so many things to do if you enjoy the outdoors in the Tennessee Valley. And then another area, we talk about economic growth. Um, we have a, a really strong organization that works to bring industry into the valley, you know, that does bring us electric load and more customers for us, but a large focus is jobs for the people of the Tennessee Valley and to bring more money into the economy of the areas here in the Tennessee Valley. And just I can think over the last several years, we have had Google, Amazon, Ford, um, lots of companies make significant investments here in the Tennessee Valley, which is, is helping our communities very much. Now, our power system you'll see here, it's a, again a map, but we've put on here all the different kinds of uh, electrical generation that we have. We have about 260 nuclear, coal, natural gas, and hydro generating units. We also have over 14 solar energy sites. We have wind energy. And then our transmission network consists of more than 16,000 miles of high voltage lines. And um, you know, hundreds of substation switch yards and, and that type of equipment. One of the things too that um, when we talk about Tennessee Valley, we have the generation and transmission. So those are the larger um, substations and lines. And then the smaller, uh, lower voltage lines that you see in most of your communities and cities, um, those tend are distribution lines. So our local power utilities, own and maintain those local distribution lines, whereas Tennessee Valley owns and maintains those larger high voltage transmission lines. Here's one of the uh, cool, more modern graphics. As, as Rudy mentioned, we have partnered with 154 local power communities, well, excuse me, local power companies. And this is also different than what I grew up with. When I grew up in the state of Alabama, um, everybody knew Alabama Power Company because we made, we made the electricity, we transmitted it, we distributed it, and we paid our power bill to Alabama Power. And uh, in Tennessee Valley, many times the community sees 
the company they're paying their electricity bill to, such as EPB or other smaller companies. And so sometimes it's a struggle for them to realize that Tennessee Valley Authority is unique. And sometimes it's hard for them to see us because we're not the ones they're paying their bills to. But we are, we do serve um, 10 million people in the Tennessee Valley, um, over 700,000 businesses, and we have over 50 some odd direct served customers. And so the local power companies are where we sell power to a, a cooperative and then they turn around and sell it to the customer at their homes. But in other cases where there is large industry, we provide power directly to them rather than through a local power company. Here are just um, a number, a few other numbers showing um, what we have invested in the Tennessee Valley and um, what we do. So here I have already mentioned that we don't get taxpayer funding and that we do make um, annual payments to our local and federal governments in lieu of tax. All right, so let's talk about challenges and how the electricity industry, generation electricity has had to uh, adjust <laughs> over the years, sometimes daily it feels like. I think many of you are probably familiar with different environmental requirements that we, ha we have dealt with over the years. You know, you have air and water and those things change a good bit as, the, as politics change. So depending on what president we have in place, what agenda that they may have, whether it is a Republican or Democratic agenda, we, we are trying to anticipate what will happen. So for instance, if there is a um, clean air rule that we go and work to implement, sometimes you can get into the implementation phase of that. And then it, when the political regime changes, that may be delayed or postponed or taken off the plate. But if, if four years later, the um, regime changes, it comes back into play. So many times the type of projects we have to do for environmental regulations, they're high dollar and take multiple years to plan and implement. So that's um, so an area where we are constantly trying to hit the right mark because any most of the additional costs we put into something like that ends up being transferred to the rate payer. And we do wanna keep our rates as low as possible for the people of the Tennessee Valley. One of the things that has been more unique in the last 10 years or so is um, public opinion and customer preferences. If you looked back 20 or 30 years ago, even further back, when people thought about power, they just wanted the lights to come on when they turned the switch on. They weren't thinking about where that power came from. Now with um, increased social media, um, more television outlets, we are looking, the customer is influencing um, what we do in the utility industry, right? You see there's a great desire for renewables, greener energy, and those are great things because we do wanna protect our environment and do the right thing. But sometimes the public opinion is not always based on fact. So for instance, when you look at solar and wind energy, which is what you hear more of now, that we want, they don't realize that those things drive cost up and that there are unique challenges around solar and wind that, that, that aren't the same as the challenges you face in coal and gas. So for example, you know, if you're dealing with solar energy or wind energy, that's weather dependent. You know, if you, I, I believe in most areas you've seen on a hot summer day where the sun can be shining and it be 100 degrees 
And then at some point in the afternoon, all of a sudden you have cloud cover and rain. So if you're dealing with solar energy at that point, you do need that source of energy. But what do you do during that hour where the rain shot clouds come in and the rain showers come down? You've got to quickly replace that lost generation with another source of generation. So one of our challenges and where we have to think care carefully plan is, how do you find generation that you can turn on and off quickly when your wind or your solar turns on and off? So you have to create that balance for what the customer needs. And that's quite a bit of a challenge. In some cases, it almost requires you to put double the amount of generation on the ground. If you have 600 megawatts of solar energy that can disappear with a rainstorm, then you need to have 600 megawatts of power that you can ramp up very quickly to replace that in the meantime. Um, I know we've all dealt with COVID um, issues in the last two years. For the generation industry, we challenged our workforce how to work differently, how to still support our generating plants, which cannot be, which all can't be without people at them. How do you keep those employees safe that do still have to be at the plants? And how do we provide support to the plants and to our transmission lines from the people that were previously in our offices? So we've had a quite a bit of a shift and um, and that's, it's been hard for some of us that though we have came out of the other end with more flexibility than we had before. Cybersecurity has been a really, really big deal um, for the power generation industry. I think it's been for everybody, but when it comes to all the changes we have to make with large, both information technology systems and operational technology systems, um, it, it, we're, it's hard for a big utility to change quickly and the cybersecurity requirements and challenges come in fast and furious. Keeping um, the infrastructure requirements, keeping our transmission lines upgraded. Also, when you look at our mix of generation, the coal plants that we do have, um, the retrofits we've had to make for environmental regulations have been very costly and they make it very difficult and, and very costly for us to run those plants. So even if the public opinion and greener energy weren't driving us to use more gas, more solar, we probably would really have to because just economically running some of these coal plants with so many people is a challenge. Energy demand, and here I'm talking about load. You know, we have to monitor anticipated load growth to plan for what our future energy needs will be because a power plant doesn't just go up overnight. And so what we've seen here is that during COVID, we were anticipating that um, power, that load levels would not increase over the next 10 years very much. But what we saw after COVID but that a lot of when people moved, started working from home, we even had more people move into the Tennessee Valley area. Um, our, in, our load growth has actually gone up unexpectedly and we were not always prepared for it. And that means that sometimes we've had to purchase power at a higher cost than we might have generated it for if we had understood and been more prepared. Distributed generation, people want to put um, solar panels on their homes. The, some people want to have generators at their homes. Our local power companies want to invest in their own generation. And that makes it a challenge when you're trying to manage the generation that you are creating as a company and how that interfaces with a customer who also has a desire to make electricity. Fuel supply is another really big challenge. Coal prices and coal availability. Coal prices have gone up, coal availability has gone down, the whole supply and demand. Um, 
but some of the things that have been happening overseas recently have made those costs more volatile. And those are costs that we also have to pass on to our customer and um, technology. So I will, we'll, we'll just, in the sake of time, we'll go on to the next slide. So Tennessee Valley is um, investing in cleaner energy. You'll see here on the bottom, a, a makeup of what our FY21 um, generation plan was. We have, uh, we're retiring our coal units. We'll be retiring all of those coal units. Right now the plan is 2035 for all the coal units to be retired. Something people don't think about um, when we talk about coal, it, it is the right thing to do to move forward both from an environmental standpoint um, and economic standpoint to move away from coal. But what this does, um, it leaves a lot of employees displaced and it creates fear amongst many of our employees about worry about what they will do next. Most of our replacement generation does not require as many um, people to be there and operating the plant. So it is hard to replace these employees and to get them a different job. And many of them, because it's been a rural area, a lot of our employees have lived where they live for years. Their families have lived there for decades and they have a lot invested in the area. Many have farms, um, you know, and so that it makes it hard for many of them to relocate because sometimes we do have a job, but if you were previously working in um, East Tennessee at Rogersville, coal, at a coal plant in Rogersville, say John Sevier, you know, the new opportunity we might have would be at a gas plant in the Memphis area, which is uh, about eight hours away. So that, that's, that's really hard um, for our employees. It does help that as we bring more companies into the Tennessee Valley, we hope that we can work to train some of our employees for opportunities in other areas. But that is one of the things that is really hard on us as a company is thinking about the people impact of these changes. I did not put a slide in here. I haven't said much about hydro, but we do have the Tennessee River is, is huge and our hydro um, fleet is large. They are a little, they are, and they're old. So we are struggling with um, making refurbishments to that infrastructure as well. Also, it is free electricity. We always say that water, um, you know, when we have the water to generate, um, but the, the volume of the electricity they generate is not as high. So it does have challenges. We do have a, a facility called, it's, a, it's Raccoon Mountain Pump Storage Facility. It's a very unique plant and there are, there are not many throughout the United States. The interesting thing about a pump storage facility is that it acts as both a load and a battery almost. So what we do with the Raccoon Mountain is it allows us to generate electricity through, through water when you need the elect, extra electricity, but we turn around and if we need to use electricity, we will pump the water back up the mountain to a storage pond and store it there for when we do need the electricity. And you think, why would you do that? Well, one thing is a pump storage station is gonna be an ideal answer to the problem of the wind and sun, you know, changing quickly on you. Raccoon Mountain can, can generate quickly when needed to. So that is one um, aspect of why it's so important because sometimes you don't think about it, but for instance, say right now when we have, it's really cold at night, We'll use a lot of electricity in the in the evening, but when it's mild during the day, you don't need all that. So your load pro profile changes throughout individual day. Your you might use um, at your lowest point in the day, you might use thirteen thousand megawatts 
And at your highest point in the day, you might use 25,000 megawatts. So a utility or generating electricity, you have to figure out also to adjust to weather, but then you have to adjust to the usage, electricity usage pattern of the customers, um, even throughout a 24 hour period. And that's challenging because typically a coal plant and especially a nuclear plant, you don't just start those units up quickly. They take some ramp up time. So you have to know in advance. So some of, some of this generations, for instance, like a gas plant, will use it for a quick start as well. So just some unique aspects there to um, while we have different energy mixes. Here he is, uh, sh shows what our power supply plan, well, what we used in fiscal year 05, um, what our plan for this fiscal year is, and then what our fiscal year 2030 looks like with our um, different power supplies. So you'll see in FY05, we're looking at 57% coal. And then you will see that it's only 5% in 2030. So that's a big change. We have definitely had an increase in gas. We're really working hard to maintain our hydro. We've increased wind and solar. And then one of the things TVA is also pretty proud of is that we were the first utility in 2000s to start a new nuclear generation facility. So in, I think it was in 2016, we started Watts Bar Nuclear Plant Unit 2. So that's something um, unique to TVA as well. And then carbon reductions, that's uh, all in the political envir and environmental discussions in today's world. We have reduced our carbon footprint by 60% since 2005. That's really significant. And you'll see here what our glide paths are for um, the next 30 years. And we anticipate and aspire to be at, be at net zero on carbon by the year 2050. So I will tell you a little bit about me. So we'll go from technical to personal. And actually, I'm much more familiar with this story than I am the TVA story since I, since I lived it. Some of the TVA uh, I um, had to do a little prep work for. Um, so I tried to do this with pictures and uh, because that's more interesting to see than words. But I will, um, my story starts in Clanton, Alabama, so very rural, poor town, and um, my parents were divorced when I was about four years old, so I grew up living in a single wide trailer um, with a single mother raising two daughters. I was, I'm the oldest, and um, that shaped me um, a whole lot because when I look back and remember parts of my childhood, um, it didn't feel good being the, the person who lived in a trailer when you had friends who lived in nice big um, brick homes and um, their parents were more educated. I remember hearing, you know, my mother cry at night behind her bedroom door because she was struggling to figure out how she was going to pay her bills. And I think back of the two things that I remember the most that my, my mother instilled in me was um, first, love your sister. So this picture here by the trailer is my sister. And um, although we fought like crazy when we lived at home and she would tell you that um, she remembers that I was bossing her around from, from the day that she could remember anything. And I'd say I'm a, that I wasn't a leader back then, but she says I, I was pretty doggone bossy. But the second thing, so my mother told me to love her. So that that is just um, an integral part uh, of who I am with my sister. And then she said, taught me, um, never rely on a man to take care of you. You need to grow up and be capable of uh, providing and taking care of yourself. And I don't know that would have struck home with me as much if I hadn't seen her struggle so very much 
through those years growing up. Um, why the peach? <laughs> if you ever travel through the state of Alabama and if you drive down I-65 uh, headed to the beach, that's when most people are, are go through Clinton, Alabama. Um, it's known for peaches. So there's a big, huge peach park in Chilton County. There was the peach festival every year and the peach queen and all that stuff that goes with it. But that's what um, Chilton County is known for. So we'll go talk, thinking about, you know, my mom telling me um, not to rely on men to take care of me. Nothing, nothing against men. I have a lot of men I love, um, but I really needed to, to, I was good in school. I was good in math and science. I knew I needed to go to college so, so I could make a better living for myself and have a better chance. I actually was the first one um, in my family to go to college and get a college degree. I decided to go into to electrical engineering. It was because when I was in high school, I was good in math and science. And I had one of my high school teachers say that I should go into electrical engineering. Didn't know what it did. I always tell people that I thought when I went into electrical engineering that I would be able to wire houses and fix TVs. I don't know where I came up with that, but that's what electrical meant to me in the world I lived in. And uh, so I went to the University of Alabama. I got my degree in electrical engineering. I cannot wire houses nor fix televisions. <laughs> um, while I was uh, at the University of Alabama, I was lucky enough to learn about the, the a Southern, Southern Company's summer intern program. And I joined, it was actually Alabama Power Company the first summer that I worked for, that I worked when I was in college. And I was with the Sunopco project, which was Southern Nuclear Operating Company. And by the second summer that I had worked with Alabama Power Company. It was now where I worked with Southern Nuclear. And when I graduated college, um, I went to work for Southern Nuclear Operating Company at Farley Nuclear Plant. So there's a picture there of Farley Nuclear Plant. Uh, I started in engineering, but I don't know that I ever did any real engineering design work like many engineers do. I think that because you, as you all know, in engineering, you learn to solve problems and, and you show that you're tenacious. So um, I went to, to Farley and learned to solve problems and tried to be tenacious. And I did do their senior reactor operators program there, which really teaches you command and control. Um, my husband got frustrated with me at the time because when you get on the simulator, you have to start barking orders so I would come home and I was like Mike take out the trash repeat it back to me three-way communications so um I attribute again I told you my sister said I was bossy I thought I became bossy when I got my SRO license she said it was way before the end so you know who knows um, I am married I did meet my husband at Farley Nuclear Plant I have three daughters all of them there with me and my husband. And then I actually have six grandkids. I couldn't find a photograph that had all six of them, but here are the two youngest. Um, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. These young men are um, near Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I am Nana to those six grandkids. They uh, make your life very, very rich. And then you will see my niece and nephew here. So. My sister and I have a really amazing relationship, and um, I feel like that her kids are my kids, too, and I have been lucky enough to be part of their lives. Um, over the years, you'll see my Peloton uh, logo here. Somebody asked, like, I saw a joke once of, how do you know somebody has a Peloton? Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> so I am passionate about my Peloton. Of course, I have not been able to um, out-exercise the calories I've been eating since COVID started. Um, I'm also a dog mom. You will see here I have a sheep -a doodle and a Dotson. The Dotson there on the right is a female. She's the oldest and she is the boss um, of this relationship here between the two of them. He weighs over five times as much as she does. And usually she is growling at him and has white fur. 
in her mouth. She hates him as much as he loves her and wants to play with her. So we have uh, an interesting time. Can't leave out TVA in the story of Dana White. Um, I started TVA in 2005. I had left uh, Southern Nuclear and Farley Nuclear Plant. I initially went to work at TVA in nuclear at uh, Watts Bar Nuclear Plant. But I was, I realized uh, when I went, came to TVA that there was so much more to the world than nuclear power. I think that when I first, when I realized I wasn't gonna fix TVs and warehouses, I decided I wanna be a chief nuclear officer of a nuclear fleet. I realized that that was probably a little more intense and I wanted more of a personal life. And when I came to TVA, I was able to learn and grow in a, a lot of ways. Um, I was, uh, after I left nuclear at one point in my career, that's a Widow's Creek fossil plant there. Um, at one point, I had a cool video in here. It was sad to say, but this Widow's Creek fossil plant, one of the best jobs I had was the general manager of Widow's Creek fossil plant. There were two of their eight units still remaining at the time. And when I worked at Widow's Creek, at, excuse me, when I worked at Widow's Creek Fossil Plant, we had intended to um, make seven and eight part of our long-term portfolio for TVA. But that was um, probably around 2010, after I had been at Widow's Creek for a couple of years, we decided we would retire those last two units as well. And about two and a half years ago, we demolished those sites. And there's a really um, cool but sad video to see if you look on the internet or on YouTube and look at what is Creek Fossil Plant Demolition, where they blew up um, those two plants and you saw them implode. It was cool but sad. Um, a lot, I worked with a lot of amazing people there. Um, and they had to find other jobs as well. The, uh, I put in here, I was, I was the safety director for about three years. And um, that was interesting. I think I had complained too many times about safety and the kind of safety support I was getting. So they put me in charge of that. And I'll tell you a little later about one of the unique things I learned there. You'll see a gas turbine to the left. I worked in um, gas outages and then um, I'll talk about Dare to Lead. So there you've got uh, Dana White's, um, my story in, in pictures. And then just Rudy, I wanted to use this one slide. Rudy mentioned I was in generation services, field services, and we have a support organization that supports our coal, gas, and hydro fleet. And this is just a little overview of the different things we do in generation services to show what, um, while, while we have to generate plant, we've got um, to also have those systems and people working in the background. We provide, um, we plan and execute outages. We have now all of our engineering resources centralized into one team and they are split up regionally. Um, we have a lot of performance metrics and monitoring that we do. We have major projects that we plan and oversee. And then the people side of things where we have safety, human performance in our corrective action program. And um, this was my uh, attempt at being creative. Engineers are not always very creative, but I found this word cloud just thought it was interesting to, you know, to, to put all the different things um, on here. Um, I work, you know, power plant operator, my personality. I went to see a uh, psychic, not that I truly believe in those, but when I went to see one last month with just my name and my birth date, one of the things she said about me was that I was very determined. And when it kind of freaked me out that she could so easily just how she honed in and summed up what I think is probably me in one word. Um, I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about leadership. Um, while I'm strong at times, I'm also a hot mess, a frazzled hot mess at times. Um, all right. So uh, 
looking at time, I'm gonna to have to speed this up, sorry. Um, so why did I choose pivoting? Well, I mentioned I have a Peloton. Robin Arzon is a Peloton instructor. And I saw this post on social media about six or eight weeks ago. And at the time I saw it, I was kind of at a, a point of frustration with some of the things that were going on in my career, you know, sometimes things don't go um, as you want them to do. There are different plans for you. I'm going to read this um, and because it hit home for me. It's important to acknowledge that sometimes you need to pivot. That includes changing your mind about a goal or an objective, the process to get to that objective, or the timeline for that objective. Pivoting with a purpose is different than quitting. It all comes down to having an honest conversation with yourself. Is it a pivot? Or is it you simply not showing up for yourself and calling it something more palatable? The nuance really does matter. So when I said I'm a determined person, I think this is was a really good saying to me at the time because there are days where you want to quit. And maybe, you know, quitting is rarely the right answer, but maybe you need to rethink about what your purpose is, how you're supposed to get to something. And this particularly for me, I will say that I have spent so much of my career in power plant generation, and I have always seen my future and what I was supposed to do for TVA to be a leader in the power generation side of the business. And that was how I was supposed to make a difference. But some of the work that I have been doing in the last two years with Dare to Lead, and I've been spending more time developing individuals and leadership and exploring how to be a better person and a better leader, um, I, I think that it's quite possible that that the plan for me was not my, my way to make a difference was not just in power generation, but maybe the intent for me was to my difference that I'm supposed to make is with people, right? You know, sometimes, you know, and that was weird for me to come to that point in realization to think that maybe my, the difference I'm supposed to make for TVA is with people more than with equipment and with generating, but, um, it is a pivot for me to think differently, but it is when you ask me what I want, you know, what do I want out of my career? I always say I want to be a part of something, of making a difference for people. I just thought it was in a different place. And that's why I talk about pivoting. You know, um, I'll say that, um, you know, over, a thir over 30 years in the industry, there have been a lot of things that I've had to adjust to, to maybe dig in and be determined about, um, to try to find the right me. So here, you know, just like I've, the energy industry, even today, is still predominantly white males. Um, it was even more so 30 years ago when I got my senior reactor operator's license at Farley. I was only the third female to do so. And actually quite a number, uh, and Farley was considered progressive that I was the third female. Many, most nuclear utility, most nuclear plants did not have any women operators or women senior reactor, reactor operators. One of the things I have found that I think is different for women versus men is I have always felt like every role that I've gone into, you have to prove yourself. You know, when you look, it feels like it for the most part, men are considered, you assume they're capable of doing whatever job that, that they're put in. They even believe they're capable of those jobs more so than women do. But women, we feel like we have to always, always prove that we're worthy of a seat at the table. It's hard to find the right balance of, are you tough enough or are you too soft? You know, for women, you you're uh, you can't lead if you're not tough enough. But as soon as you uh, take a stance, you take uh, use 
louder words, harsher words, then um, you're the, the witch, you're a witch that starts with a B, right? They immediately label you. So it's hard to find that right balance for a woman. Um, also mentioned, I worked in nuclear for the first probably 18, 19 years of my career. And I literally had a mentor in nuclear that gave me an article about how to swim with sharks. Nuclear power at the time was particularly hard on people, um, personal attacks on people. You, you survived by realizing that if there was blood in the, in the water in the room, if somebody was getting chewed on by a shark, you did not jump in that bloody water. And then you learned how if you were bleeding, how did you stop it and how do you get out of it? And so then when I transitioned from nuclear to other parts of TVA, there was a demeanor that I had become good at. Instead of swimming with sharks, I sort of had a shark demeanor that didn't bode well with other parts of TVA. Lots of clicks, um, the good old boys, a lot of clicks at TVA. I'm sure it's this way everywhere. Um, sometimes it's not all boys, right? You know, some of the women have somehow gotten into a, a little click, so it's hard to find a place for yourself sometimes. Um, the paths I've taken have been different than what I thought. Um, I remember when I was asked to go to Widow's Creek Fossil Plant, I had worked at a nuclear plant for 16 years in operations I had um, one of the executives say, well, you need to go to Widow's Creek to a fossil plant because I can't see you as a leader in a plant. Now it was fine for two other men that he worked with um, to come in and become executives in his organization. But me as a woman with the same background as those two men, I had to go prove myself to him at, an, at a gas plant, even though I had worked for almost 20 years in a nuclear plant. Now, I cried and had a pity party about having to go to Widow's Creek, but I will say, sometimes those paths that are different than what you would have chosen are amazing paths because that was one of the best jobs I've ever had. I worked with an amazing group of people. Um, so you don't always, um, some of those paths are there for a reason. Worth tied to titles. Um, I think being someone who's very determined, very aggressive, very career oriented over the years, always you're looking for a title and that if you don't get a particular title, then you haven't achieved what that end goal is. And it's really more about what you bring to the table than a title. Um, I found that leadership is hard. <laughs> I have had some, I spoke at a women's panel about a year ago and a woman that I had worked with for 10 years said afterwards, you know, I really had no idea that you struggled with the same things I struggle with each and every day. So as a leader, you, you make it, sometimes it may look easier, easy, but behind um, that facade that you're putting on, there, there's a lot of challenge, a lot of things that comes with dealing with people issues that are much more challenging. Um, than the technical issues at a plant. And then um, inclusion and intersectionality. And I'm gonna, only, I'm not, I can't explain intersectionality very well, but what I'm gonna say here is that, you know, over the years, I thought that I knew what it was like to be part of a minority group, being a, a woman in the industry. What I have now realized and as we ha have, brought diversity more into the forefront or inclusion more into the forefront that, um, you know, there are other people that have different challenges. So if I think about me being a female in the workplace, what about a black female? What about men of color? What about people with different sexual preferences? And so there are so many different groups. And I think that what one of the huge things that every one of us is, is needing to pivot around as the, as the whole nation moves forward is how to include every person at the table that we have. So uh, um, <laughs> I put here advice to women 
And uh, I left it there, but then marked it out to say that I think this advice is, is true for anybody. Um, I just go back to thinking that how I mentored a young woman in the industry or how I would have mentored one 25 years ago versus today. And then it's like, really, this fits for anybody. When I started out, it was all about competition, particularly a young, among women. We were our own worst enemy um, against each other. And, uh, you know, you'd think it would be bad enough that we were competing with men, but, I, you know, we were all competing with the women, too. I would say now you need to support and mentor others. You have to. That is the only way different work groups, different types of people can fit in, support and mentor whoever you're working with. Used to, I would have said, fit in. You need to be like me and you need to figure out how to have those football conversations. I worked around people from the Navy. How do you fit yourself into a Navy conversation when you've never been a Navy nuke? Now you need to be your authentic self. People need to accept who you are. And if they can't, you don't need to be there. This, the workforce in today's time at every table and every area, you need to be able to be yourself and to be appreciated and seen for who you are. I started out thinking that work, that if you worked hard, that was enough people would see and that by working hard, you would get accomplished what you needed to do. It took me way too long to understand the importance of relationships and networking and that you can accomplish, sometimes to accomplish your goals, you need other people with you to do it, especially as you get in broader roles. Um, the importance of having people in different parts of the company in different areas. Pre used to, it was prove yourself. I would say now, trust yourself. Have that self-confidence. Know that you're worthy and that you can do whatever you set your mind out to do. You shouldn't feel like you have to constantly prove yourself. And then this next one is going into a little bit to the dare to lead. And I'll, I promise, Rudy, I'll hurry through the rest of this. But um, we used to say, keep your emotions at home. Um, and I'd say that's almost impossible to do. You can come to work and pretend you don't have emotions. But what's going on in your personal life affects everything around you. And so I'd say bring your, your full self. To the table. Um, one thing I'll just say in leadership too to think about, and this is, um, I learned this through another path I didn't want to take. After I left Widow's Creek, I became the safety director at TVA. That was when I worked with Rudy. When I started in my career, I always saw um, influence about authority, right? My, my roles had been in positions of authority leading people. And so that's much easier when you actually have the hierarchical role that gives you the power to give orders and make decisions and enforce those. And that's good, but what's much harder is influence. And that's when you have to figure out how through relationships and interactions to how to have an effect on the behavior of others. And so I went from a hierarchical role as the leader of a plant, the highest person at that plant, to safety director, which where I was needing to influence all of the company and leaders at higher levels than me, that, that change in role and that learning has really, I didn't do it very good as safety director, but it's influenced me in this service role that I have had over the last five years. So that's also, that ties back to that networking aspect and relationships that you've got to figure out how to get things accomplished um, through influence, not always hierarchical power. Talked about relationships. This is leading into Brene Brown, but about collaboration and trust. And um, here, you know, I would say that you, trust doesn't just happen overnight, but it's critical to have in your working relationships. And it's about the small actions that you take each and every day that are visible, paying attention to people, listening, and, and acts of care. So Brene Brown, she has had several books, and I would just really encourage each of you to dig into some of her work and learn about it. She had the book I started dealing with was Dare to Lead, 
and um, she also has a Netflix. I'd start by start doing. She did a TED Talk, her first TED Talk. You can find that on YouTube. She has a Netflix special that's really good. A lot of things here. Um, I'll highlight. This was something she has a quote she put in her books from the director of the London School of Economics. In the past, jobs were about muscles. Um, then they were about brains, but in the future, they'll be about the heart. And so when you look back, say in the early 1900s, it was about physical labor. As um, things happened through the 1900s, getting an education became more important and the scholastics and your knowledge. But as we move forward in today's world, the importance of understanding the relationship piece and the part about the heart is going to be more and more critical. And that's a huge change that I have seen in the 30 years that I've been in the industry. Oops, this something is not showing on this slide that it was supposed to, oh, okay, sorry. Forget, oh, forgot to change that slide. You know, um, I think one of the things that we have to change as leaders to be braver and more courageous, all of this, this stuff in the dare to lead to me ties back to our inclusion with diversity goals. I think that's true everywhere, right? Everywhere we're struggling um, and want to be a more inclusive group of people TVA, we're really struggling, working on employee engagement. And then um, sort of a new buzzword is around um, psychological safety. But beyond just physical safety, we really want uh, to have a work environment where people feel like they can bring any issue to the table and that they're included. It's safe for them to learn. We want them to contribute. Um, and challenge the status quo, that's how we get better. Here's a definition for a leader. I would tell you it's not about titles or who the executive is. In whatever role you pay, play in a company, we have individual contributors. Their position title is an individual contributor, but they way, provide way more positive influence than some people that have a positional title. So I would say, think about what you're doing and how you behave. Um, step up, put yourself out there. Um, in Dare to Lead, they talk about managing emotions um, during a difficult time and COVID certainly has. It starts giving you some tools to have hard conversations, a common way of language um, to talk to people and address issues and, um, in a way that's different than what I was taught in nuclear to, to be a little less challenging. Um, you know, instead of me jumping out to solve a problem right away or tell people what I think is the answer, um, I found it's much more fruitful to ask them questions and let them come forward with some of the answers. They're typically way better than mine and just listening to people I'm with the same passion that we want to be heard, right? We need to see and hear others. That's very important. Talk about being a leader. Um, in Brene's work, she talks about, you know, it's not us being afraid that that is the biggest problem. It's that when we feel less than or we feel attacked, we feel like we're back to into a corner. There are a lot of ways that we respond that don't don't always reflect well on us. We put up armor, we put up shields, and there are a number of different types of shields. You know, I'm a knower. So when I feel like someone um, challenges me or puts, makes me uncomfortable where I, I feel like that, um, and I'll just give you a quick example. I There's a difference between predictive maintenance and preventive maintenance. There's a unique difference. And I was on a WebEx about six months ago where someone from nuclear, I, I used the terminology incorrectly. Someone from nuclear corrected me. They went through a long diatribe to explain to me the difference between predictive and preventive maintenance. Well, it immediately made me feel less than, right? I, and so I, my first reaction was I wanted to, I sat forward in my seat and I was gonna say, well, thank you, sir, but I know the difference. And here is why, because I've been in the industry 30 years, you know, so I was gonna like, my first reaction was to tell him how much I knew instead of letting it go. It wouldn't have gotten us anywhere. Um, 
So my armor sometimes is telling you what my background and history is and why I do know what I'm doing. Um, so a lot of the work here talks about how um, the things that you do that are in your preservation mode or armor mode, once you see those, you can learn how not to overreact, not to react in that way and to bring brothers, others in and make a stronger connection with them. That serves you much better as you move forward. All right, questions. <laughs> wow, that's a fantastic talk, Dana. Uh, you know, I think people do know that about TVA, the example it sets as a, as a leader, uh, you know, to other utilities. And my TVA is made up of people like you, Dana, and it was such a heartfelt presentation that you made. And I mean, let me just share this one story. Uh, Dana used to use a slide which said something about a team. A team is not made up of people alone. A team is made up of people who support each other, care for each other, and work together for a common solution. Uh, that's really uh, great. Thank you again for this really wonderful talk. And uh, so we have some time for questions and uh, answers from Dana. So I want to open the floor to students in the audience. Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself and go ahead with your questions. She covered a lot of ground and I'm sure you have some questions. Students. Hi, um, I'm Nick. I'm from Energy Systems Engineering at Lehigh. Uh, you mentioned that there's like from 2022 to 2030, or there's no really planned expansion of nuclear. Um, can you give some reasons? And like, have you guys looked in like small modular reactors at all as a potential source? Um, so yeah. Yeah. So probably one of the reasons with nuclear that you don't see finite plans to construct is because it, they're very expensive to build and because of the regulations and getting license approvals is very challenging and can be very political um, is one of the reasons you don't see finite plans in our portfolio. However, we did announce in the last month that we are putting more money into small modular reactor um, technology, doing some um, planning and work there. We actually have a Clinch River site at TVA that has been intended to be a nuclear site. And we have, since I have been at TVA over the last 15 years, we have been on and off again on how much investment we were gonna put into the SMR small modular reactors. And we had not done much in the last few years, but we, we are forming a, a organization focused just on small modular reactors. Um, and actually my current boss just got moved to a senior vice president role that's gonna be involved with that. So you will see more in the news about TVA and small modular reactors going forward. Yeah. And which is, and which warms my heart because I'm a nuclear girl to start off with anyway. So I'd love to see that. A yeah, matter of fact, Dana, one of our students, he's a current student, he works for that company, Kairos Power, that is working with uh, at Clinch River. Hey, wow. Yeah. Questions for Dana from students? Unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and go for the question. Edwin? Hi, Dana. Thank you so much for the talk. That was very insightful. Um, my question is a bit of a two-part question, and it follows what Nick asked about. And I was wondering, I know you're still very, I'd say for the meantime, a little dependent on like the fossil fuel plants in terms of like meeting demand whenever it's required. So with the current landscape of things, I was wondering, this is just a question, I guess, what are your sources for your your coal and your natural gas at the moment for producing electricity through that and has the situation like the Ukraine-Russia um, 
debacle has it had an impact on your business or is it so far not spilled over to you guys at tva well no it, it is having an impact on our business so i would say one thing that is both covid and uk ukraine related is calls for supplies just in general particularly metals and things like that that we large components um, our supply chain is, is struggling. Costs are going up on that side of the house as far as um, metals and materials. Now, with respect to fuel supply, we actually, one of the things we do in the coal, we have long-term contracts to buy coal. And the our coal prices will not fluctuate with the mark as nearly as much as the market. Um, and you know, it's interesting your, your question because we just, I just had a discussion came up about this today is that the way we, what we call dispatch our plants, like when we decide um, the order that we're going to start a unit, you know, and we start with the cheapest, right? We start with the cheapest cost and, and gradually as you need more electricity, you know, your demand goes up, you're going to end up having to start the most expensive. Well, typically the coal plants, a portion of the coal plants are the cheapest, then our combined cycle, and so there's a mix. Well, with some of the coal price changes in the last week or so, um, and the way we calculate dispatch, a fuels price component is put in there, and we shut down a large coal plant this past weekend because of that fluctuation in coal prices that have been going on. And we're having discussion internally that we need to change the way we dispatch because we were chained, we shut down the unit based on what the market price of coal was. However, our on the ground cost of coal was much lower and we have long-term contracts. So we're not gonna go buy coal at that high price because we have these long-term contracts that protect us, but we were dispatching the unit based on the coal market. And that was that's kind of sending the wrong signals because it's not our actual cost of delivery. And then, um, so that's, we are working to make some adjustments because we, we, don't, we don't feel like it is accurately done. Now gas prices do, we are more driven by the market for gas prices. We do something they call, we hedge gas prices. So about 30% of our gas price we have purchased in advance at, a, at an optimal price, but not our entire gas supply. So we do, um, the market does drive our gas sites a good bit, um, whether or not we dispatch them so that changes. And where gas prices have been recently, they tend to be, used more than the coal sites and particularly with this increase in coal price that we've seen in the last week or so so we we do we are um we are tied to that the other thing that we sometimes have to balance is purchasing power so depending on the cost of that highest dispatch unit you know as we go up the dispatch compendium there are times where we can buy um, additional electricity for cheaper and we can generate it. So sometimes we'll do that. So for instance, this morning, it was a really cold morning, colder than we anticipated. We had a point this morning where we had a peak load and the company had to make a decision, do we start up a simple cycle gas unit that can start up quickly, but is kind of expensive, or do we buy market power? A lot of times we'll just go ahead and buy market power because of the other generators, generating companies around us. But this morning we did not anticipate to run our simple cycle gas units and we ran them in, out of plan because the purchase prices were higher around us than we anticipated. So they are making decisions pretty much every hour in what we call our system operations center. They're making decisions all around the clock on whether or not we start an, the next plant or buy power to keep up with what the actual demand is. We, we do, we predict it, but we sometimes miss the mark and we missed the mark a little bit this morning. Yeah. Questions from students, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. So I'll go to the chat box. Uh, Dana, a question from 
at, at D Dehran. Nuclear has 41% in clean energy investment uh, is a higher percentage due to cost effectiveness or technical viability. And I think he's referring to the 2030 plan where nuclear is going to be 41% of the pie. And uh, you know, it's, quite, it's quite impressive that it's transitioning to a clean energy utility. Well, it it is they it's higher because um, so nuclear cost per kilowatt is lower than most. However, cost to build is really high. So once you have a nuclear plant in existence, it is typically going to be your most cost effective unit to run. Also, nuclear as we have it now is always base load. Um, they don't load follow. So you typically start a nuclear plant and you're, you're ideally gonna run it at 100% power the entire time. You're not gonna move it around as things change. Um, so it is higher percentage um, due to, it is our lower cost now that it's built in the long, long we've had it. And um, so yeah, I hope I've answered that question. Yeah. We typically don't we're not, we we don't typically build new though because of cost and if you look right now southern company is trying to put to get Vogel three and four and who new nuclear build and getting it licensed that is just it's a monstrous um hard task to do. Yeah. So this is a related question and I kind of triggered from this previous question is is it possible that you could use nuclear power to baseload more intermittent resources because they could charge batteries or charge a raccoon mountain, as you mentioned. So this way you have quote a stable renewable supply. Is there some plans for using you know, nuclear to charge batteries to supplement or renewables? So yes, that is, there is. I am not as knowledgeable of what our plans in the battery front are, but I do know that um, in our technology area um, for new generation, they are exploring battery storage. And that would be ideal because one of the struggles is um, with the current nuclear technology, we don't really need more base load. So to put a traditional, to add a traditional nuclear plant to our mix right now wouldn't be ideal because we don't need more base load and we use them for base load. And SMR on the other hand is designed for more for intermittent loads, but we will have to invest and, and build the battery technology um, so that we can have more storage. That's, that's got to be, that has to be part of the answer is more ways to store. We even have gone back and revisited a couple of different times, do we need, should we build another pump storage station? Because it in the current environment and as we move forward, they're very expensive, but they're one of the best solutions to the struggle of balancing out um, wind and solar that the pump storage stations are. So, but yes, we will look for storage opportunities that, that has to be a part of the answer. Here's an interesting question in the chat box, Dana. Uh, what is TVA's site reuse plan for their coal plants? I know that you guys have shut down quite a lot, quite a number. Yeah, in most every one of the cases that we've had so far, we have um, imploded the plant and we're going back to a brownfield or a greenfield plan and to repurpose those areas. There is one, site though Johnsonville which is in a western part of Tennessee they have they had a coal plant we retired several years ago they also have 20 simple cycle units um, adjacent to there we are going to end up retiring some of those gas plants the simple cycle units because of their very old technology and expensive to run we are putting a putting together a research project there where we're gonna be exploring a Johnsonville carbon capture. Uh, we're gonna explore hydrogen 
as a form of, as an energy source and how we would use that to generate. And then we'll also be exploring battery star storage there. I'm not intimately involved with that. And that's something that has really amped up in the last year or so, but we do plan to reuse that area in that way. They also have a, a large chemical plant that we supply steam to there, which there are some things too that make that area advantageous for us to do some research type work there. Um, because of that, that chemical plant is a good partner with us for some of our needs. And, and um, that will help. I will say that we typically, I think you'll see Tennessee, and this is something, Rudy, you may find interesting. I think it looks as if we're going to get deeper into research and development than it feels like we have been in, say, the last 10 or 15 years I've been involved with the company. I think it was one of the early premises of TVA was a lot of R&D and it feels mm -hmm. like we've gotten a bit away from it, but I think it looks like we're headed there more so now with the Johnsonville Research Facility and um, we've recently acquired, we've recently announced partnership on batteries and with SMR, so several things going on that sound intriguing. Uh, TVA is at the forefront of many things. Yeah. Uh, Anybody with a question you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, please? You got a few more minutes. Just want to let you know that next week, uh, Monday, we'll have a presentation by uh, Ms. Swaminathan. She's the CEO of a battery company called Malta. And they have received uh, equity funding for putting together this technology. So that's next Monday at 12 noon. So we still got a couple of minutes for a question for Dana. Unmute yourself. Brody, there are a couple in the chat uh, box. Did you get a chance to ask those yet? Which one's that? There's a couple in the chat box from yeah. Joe and Adiran. Yeah, Joe, I think I've covered that. Uh, and Alexander, there's, there's well, two others, nuclear, 41% cleaner. Yeah, that, yeah, we covered that too. TVA's site reuse plan for their coal plants. Yeah. Um, this is hearing no questions. Uh, thank you again for your attention. Uh, Dana, thanks a lot. This was really a very interesting uh, presentation. I think you, you kind of, in many ways, you reflect what TVA is all about. You know, you have a, um, you know, you're, you know, developing leadership, leading by the heart, and uh, these are all excellent things. You know, working through, you know, a lot of adversities in your own career, and um, it's really. Great that you could share this with our students. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we will see all of you next week. Uh, same time, 12 noon. And Dana, thank you very much for your presentation. And if you could send us uh, your presentation, I will be able to share this with the students. All right. So. Uh, well, I just, as I was talking, a couple of questions popped up. Let me make sure we still have four minutes. I'm uh, good. Oh, okay. These are all uh, promos from our, from our, <laughs> about our department. All right. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And again, Dana, thank you very much for on behalf of Lehigh University. Thank you, everyone. Susan, you're still there? Yep, I'm still here. All right. I'm on the phone yet. <laughs> yeah. So you were not able to join via computer audio?
Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. It's ever since I made changes to um, the the computer had uh, the Dell updates and Windows updates. So I'm going to go back and uninstall the the webcam, which has audio on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go do that and see if I can fix it. All right, so we still got some hangers on. Okay. It was right. me. I, well, I removed every, I removed all the rest of the ones that were kind of hanging out. <laughs> well, that was a, quite an interesting talk. Yeah, you know what? Oh my God, she's got the cutest accent whatsoever. You, you know, but her experience and life she's lived, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed when she was out, you know, working with her. I just enjoyed the perspective she would bring. So, and some of the things are real, you know, I think uh, when she went through this working at a power plant as a woman, you know, it was mm -hmm. cat calls and wolf, you know, uh, whistles. I wonder if, uh, if Anna got anything out of this seminar <laughs> Anna, she, she was there right Anna, I yeah we will, we'll hear about it this afternoon in our class yeah interesting the only one uh the only student that didn't show up i think was um was Oma? nocha yep yeah she's uh now you know she hasn't submitted her assignments yet so i'm a little bit worried uh, that stinks yeah Anyway. I was trying to quick get in there the um, the YouTube email address or the the YouTube link so that people could subscribe and maybe I'll